Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Manfred Phillip. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, talk by Ian Ona Johnson, a professor at Notre Dame University. We'll talk on a historical approach to German relations relations. Before we get to the talk, I'd like to thank some people who made this event possible. One is Mechtel Schmidt-Feist of New York University, uh, who will be assisting uh, during the event today. Uh, the other is Milan Wojcik, who a reporter for the Gazette of Wyborska, who assists, assisted in um, attracting participants in, in the audience from Poland and other places in Eastern Europe. Um, as you can imagine, a talk on German Russian relations has a lot to do with Poland because of the geographical locations and the history. Um, and also, I'd like to thank Mary Kate Boulderer for managing the post production video processing so that this can go up on YouTube uh, and be seen by many more people. Uh, without further ado, though, I'd like to um, welcome Professor Johnson. We look forward to hearing you talk. Thank you. Okay. All right. Can everyone uh, everyone see that slide there? Yes. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you, Manfred, for organizing this to all of our, our sponsors and to all of you for attending and uh, many different time zones. And uh, for many of you, I know this is a busy time in the semester if you're teaching. Uh, thank you for, for taking some time to, to join us. What I'm going to be doing today is uh, is discussing my my recent book, Faustian Bargain, the Soviet German Partnership and the Origins of the Second World War, uh, give you a sense of the argument, the evidence uh, that I produced there. And then I also want to talk about some of the contemporary implications. So I'm going to conclude with some some thoughts about the role of this story in contemporary events, particularly in Ukraine and and, and some of the broader takeaways of this work uh, for for our contemporary moment. So again, here is, uh, here is the book. My book is essentially about how the Second World War happened just two brief decades after the end of the First World War, the, the conflict that had supposedly uh, been the war to end all wars. The Second World War began in Europe on September 1st, 1939, when 50 divisions of the reborn German army invaded Poland from the West. Two days later, Great Britain and France honored their pledges to Poland and declared war on Germany. And two weeks after that, on September 17th, 1939, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east. That the war began over Poland and that it happened with the Soviets and Germans essentially working in collaboration was a product of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. On the 23rd of August, 1939, Hitler and Stalin had agreed to partition much of Eastern Europe between them as well as exchange military equipment and raw materials. The story of that German-Soviet pact is usually seen as a moment of opportunism, where two dictators who despised each other essentially saw a temporary advantage in working together. But in fact, this is not the whole story. Germany and the Soviet Union had been working together off and on for most of the preceding two decades, in fact, and the destruction of Poland was essentially the culmination of a relationship that had in fact begun in the dying days of the First World War. So my, my book is a story of that tempestuous relationship that spanned essentially two decades and led the world back to a new world war, even more horrific in its death toll and consequences than the first. The idea that the Soviets and Germans would begin working together in 1919 and 1920, in the early days uh, of the interwar period, was difficult to imagine at that particular moment. It's hard to overstate how much the two sides despised each other. In the same year they would begin negotiating, Lenin would call the German military savages, plunderers, and predators in public remarks, and even suggest that they set the world record for war atrocities. For the Bolsheviks, the right-wing military officers with whom they would soon be dealing, they were the archetypes of counter-revolution. They were the, the standard images on Soviet propagandas, as you can see uh, from the image here on the left. The German officer corps in the aftermath of the First World War were about as fond of Bolshevism in turn. General Wilhelm Gruner referred to Lenin and Trotsky as enemies and the devil in official correspondence. 
And a Reichswehr non-commissioned officer in 1927 would write that the rulers of present day Russia are common bloodstained criminals, the scum of humanity carrying on the most cruel and tyrannical regime of all time. This was more or less the common view in the Reichswehr in 1927, a year that saw hundreds of German officers and men go to live in the Soviet Union. So why did these two groups, the German military and the Soviet state, why did they begin cooperating? Well, the answer lay in large part in the international order constructed by the victors of the First World War. In the summer of 1919, the Allies, Britain, France, America, and Italy in particular, had agreed upon the Treaty of Versailles, which ended Germany's participation in the First World War. Germany was to be forcibly disarmed and to pay reparations. Foreign troops would occupy its industrial heartland, and Germany would lose over 10% of its territory to its neighbors, particularly the new state of Poland to the east. In addition, assuming that the German army was in large part responsible for the outbreak of the war, the victorious allies dismantled it, reducing it from over 5 million to only 100,000 men and further banning Germany from possessing aircraft, armored vehicles, submarines, chemical weapons, all of the modern accoutrements of war. These terms were viewed as so harsh by the German high command, what was left of it in the aftermath of the war, that they actually met in the summer of 1919 to discuss the possibility of reopening the war. But they concluded that that was not possible. Germany was not in a position uh, to, to contest the allied demands militarily. So instead, from that moment onward, the German high command embarked on a largely surreptitious program to restore German military might, concealed initially even from Germany's own government. The aim, which I believe is, is fairly explicit in, uh, in the writings of the German high command and even in things like technological procurement and design, was to fight a new war against France and Poland, not simply to overturn the Treaty of Versailles, but to actually overturn the entire results of the First World War. Now, meanwhile, in 1919, the Soviet Union was not formally in existence. The Bolshevik Revolution at that juncture was in the midst of a violent fight for its survival against the combined forces of 18 allied states led by Great Britain and France on one hand and uh, the Red Army on the other. Not until the fall of 1919 would it become clear or at least likely that the Bolsheviks would even survive. Once they emerged victorious, their, their country suffered a, a great deal uh, in terms of its uh, security situation. It was unrecognized by almost all of the states in the world, suffering from famine, typhus, outbreaks, cholera. The economy was in ruins. The new regime in Moscow was equally hostile to the victors of the First World War as their German military counterparts, as they viewed them as the strongest elements of the capitalist world, states which had just invaded Russia with the aim of destroying the revolution. It was this moment of isolation for the German military and for Soviet political leaders that the two state or the two groups would begin exchanging envoys, intelligence, and technology. At that juncture, there was an ongoing war between Poland and, the, and Soviet Russia, which further highlighted how much the two sides had in common. Molotov would refer to Poland as that monstrous bastard of Versailles in public addresses that year. Well, General Hans von Zeich, the key figure on the German military side would pledge to his senior officers that he would quote, wipe Poland off the map of Europe, end quote. The first secret conferences would follow not long after in the summer of 1921. In April of 1922, Soviet Russia and Weimar Germany would sign the Treaty of Rapallo, which normalized relations between the two sides. Five months later, People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs, Leon Trotsky, and German General Hans von Zeich would formalize an arrangement to initiate secret military cooperation. Now, what exactly did they hope to achieve by working in unison? For German General Hans von Zeich, commanding the, the Reichswehr, his hope was to rebuild German military inside the Soviet Union, away from the inspector, inspectors and allied soldiers then occupying much of Germany. He had three means to accomplish that end. The first was to relocate banned German industrial production, the sorts of factories the allies were at this juncture dismantling in Germany, relocate experts and equipment to the Soviet Union, where engineers could retain their skills, remain in militarily relevant fields, and build up stockpiles of weapons for future use. 
Next, he foresaw that German officers, very few in number after the war, capped at only 4,000 by the Treaty of Versailles, should be trained on the most advanced equipment of war to become more technologically proficient than their adversaries or future adversaries so that they might be capable of winning a high-speed war of maneuver in the next war. Within Germany, that was not really possible in 1922. As you get a sense from this image, this is how the German army practiced tank maneuvers prior to relocating training uh, facilities to the Soviet Union. These are essentially paper mache bits tacked onto a car to simulate a tank. Not exactly uh, the basis for a future uh, modern military. In addition, Zeig to hoped to develop new technologies of war themselves inside the Soviet Union. Tanks, aircraft, and submarines could not be built safely in Germany because of the several thousand allied inspectors stationed across the country. By relocating engineers, industrial plant, and laboratories to the USSR, the Reichswehr could essentially begin a technological rearmament process. Now, how about for the Soviets? What was their aim in working with the German military? Well, Trotsky, the head of the Red Army until 1925, sought to rebuild a devastated Soviet Union and a, essentially a very disorganized Red Army with, with German assistance. He saw German plans to relocate industry to the USSR as a critical means to helping industrialize the Soviet Union. He hoped to have German officers train and prepare the next generation of professional Soviet officers, engineers, and scientists, ones in particular who might be politically reliable. The Red Army was in pretty disastrous shape in the aftermath of the Russian Civil War. Its Air Force was down to 73 aircraft, almost none of which were considered safe to fly. The few tanks in, in the Red Army's employ were re redeployed to plow fields in Ukraine in 1923. Germany was viewed as a means of modernizing and mechanizing the Red Army that was not capable of defending the revolution in its current state. The result would be that between 1922 and 1933, the Soviets and Germans would build a network of secret factories, military bases, and laboratories throughout the Soviet Union to achieve these goals. I've highlighted on this map the, the largest and most significant. And I'll talk very briefly about each in turn. To start with, uh, the Germans began relocating, as noted, industrial uh, production and facilities to the Soviet Union. This started almost immediately uh, upon the signing of agreements in 1922 with the, the handover of Feely, an aviation or former automobile plant converted to an aviation facility just outside of Moscow which the German military effectively took over in 1923 with help from the Junkers Corporation. This factory would produce fighters and eventually the first Soviet four-engine bombers with German assistance. Several thousand Russian workers would be employed here at its peak, working under German managers and German and Russian engineers. Other facilities across the Soviet Union worked on artillery, tanks, chemical weapons, rifles, machine guns, submarines, just about anything with military utility. The scale of this economic cooperation will grow to staggering proportions. Almost every major German firm that had produced weapons in the First World War would receive contracts from the Red Army to build weapons or to modernize or construct factories, 255 German firms in total. Most of these contracts were mediated by the German army who set up their own secret embassy effectively in Moscow to oversee German investment and assist German firms in relocating to the Soviet Union. So significant was this collaboration that the Soviets actually gave German engineers Red Army officers uniforms to make sure that they suffered no interference while in the Soviet Union. To give another brief indication of how significant this would be in the industrialization of the Soviet Union, by 1940, the Soviets estimated that almost half, or excuse me, more than half, of all Soviet tank production was dependent on German built, designed, or managed factories. Now, as corporate projects in the Soviet Union took off, the German military also began to explore and ex the hope to expand direct military to military cooperation. The first of these arrangements centered on salvaging Germany's air power, which essentially had been completely dismantled by the victorious allies after the war. In 1923, Zeig arranged to dispatch German pilots to an airbase pictured here uh, near Lipetsk in so south central Russia, fairly close to the modern Ukrainian border. 
there a handful of German World War I aces began to train Soviet cadets on basic flying technique. In 1925, the German military acquired the entire base on a lease from the Soviet government. In exchange for training Soviet pilots and mechanics and allowing Soviet technicians access to anything that they brought to the field, that is prototypes, equipment, anything, the Germans could do whatever they wanted at this particular air base. What they wanted to do was train the core of a future uh, German Air Force. The German air military would begin dispatching particularly young men selected for, uh, after going through a basic commercial flight school in Germany, selected for their perceived competence uh, for a special fighter training program here at Lipetsk. The men were usually between the ages of 18 and 24. They were quite young. And the reason for this was that uh, Zeicht and, and those around him calculated that it would take between 10 and 15 years to complete the German rearmament process. And thus, the, the men being trained to be squadron leaders in the next war should be essentially uh, in their prime when that next war came. And again, they, they estimated that would be around 1938 or 39, quite accurately. The young age allowed them to, to be at their prime when that, that war would, would come in their minds. These cadets would be put through their paces by World War I aces on flight instruction, technical instruction, uh, rotating lectures on tactics, organization, uh, aircraft identification of French, British, and Polish aircraft models in particular, followed by rotating lectures on a variety of, of other topics. Interestingly, the cadets were also uh, required to take Russian language classes and some political instruction provided by Russian political officers in the evenings. Now, the flight school was quite uh, dangerous for many of these young would-be pilots. Dozens of, of them would be wounded or killed in the course of the training uh, program at Lipetsk. An entire fake corporation had to be set up, in fact, to oversee the return of bodies to Germany from the Soviet Union in boxes labeled machine tool parts. They had uh, their own hobbies while they were at the base. Many of the, the German pilots recalled their time in Russia quite fondly. A number had, uh, had Russian girlfriends or befriended their Soviet counterparts though the Soviet secret police occasionally would round up those perceived as too close to the Germans at various points in the 20s and 1930s. They also threw parties with their Soviet counterparts. I found some pretty remarkable New Year's parties of young German and Soviet officers celebrating uh, side by side. What's remarkable is even as they were ensconced in this quite lavishly supplied Air Force facility, just outside of the gates of this base, Thousands of uh, Soviet civilians were starving to death in 1932 and 33 at the peak of cooperation, victims of uh, Stalin's collectivization drive. Now, the Germans got a great deal out of these bases, new pilots, new tactics, and new technologies. Nearly a thousand pilots, mechanics, and observers would be trained there over the course of the base's existence. For context, about the size of the entire Luftwaffe when it was reestablished in 1935. 22 officers who had reached the rank of three-star general or above in the Luftwaffe, so the core uh, of the senior leadership of the Luftwaffe, studied, trained, or taught at this facility during its years of operation. In fact, the Luftwaffe uh, later would write, a uh, senior officer uh, writing a history of the organization, that, quote, the spiritual foundations of the German Air Force were developed on that Russian aeronautical field, end quote. So what did the Soviets get out of all of this? Well, they too trained pilots and mechanics and engineers alongside their, their German counterparts. But their most important priority, which is clear from Soviet archival documents, was to gain access to world-class German technology, like the Junkers K-47 prototype, which was first deployed and tested at Lipetsk during this period of cooperation. The Germans led the world, particularly in all metal, metal monoplanes, which, as it turned out, were the future of aircraft design. And the Soviets wanted access. As part of the arrangement at the base, they could essentially fly anything they wanted, take anything apart they wanted, and photograph it, uh, which they did extensively. They also sought to spy on the various German firms operating in the Soviet Union outside the boundaries of their agreements, hoping to get access to every vital, potentially vital piece of technology. Now, Lipetsk was hardly the only place that these sorts of activities were ongoing at this juncture. A few hundred miles away near Kazan, 
the Germans and Soviets established another base, this one dedicated to armored warfare, co codenamed Kama. A year after the founding of, of Lipetsk, the two sides agreed to establish this facility to test armored vehicle prototypes, to conduct maneuvers jointly, and to train the next generation of senior armored warfare uh, officers in this emerging technology. A number of the most prominent theorists of armored warfare in both Germany and the Soviet Union would study, attend, or teach there. Names like Heinz Guderian, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, Ernst Volkheim, Oswald Lutz. In total, this school would graduate only 200 officers, but they were much more senior than those studying at Lipetsk. 17 of the German officers would start the war as divisional commanders or above. Almost all of the uh, divisional commanders in the Wehrmacht uh, in 1941, commanding panzer divisions, were connected in some way to this facility. In addition, nearly every single tank that Germany would use in the first four years of the Second World War was based on prototype work that had been conducted at this facility. In fact, corporations like Krupp, which would lead the way in armored warfare uh, or armored vehicle design and production in the Second World War, they sent their entire engineering bureau, all of their designers, to live at this facility in the Soviet Union from 1928 to 1933. Now, the most secretive element of collaboration centered on chemical warfare. This picture here shows the uh, predominantly German staff of one of the two joint chemical weapons uh, testing facilities, codenamed Tomka, in 1931. Relying on human testing, sometimes on a frighteningly large scale, sometimes involving hundreds upon hundreds of Soviet conscripts in particular, the Soviets and Germans jointly experimented with new chemical agents and deployment techniques. Chemical weaponry, of course, had been used extensively in the First World War, and there was belief in both Germany and the Soviet Union that it might feature very prominently in the next war. In particular, the two sides were interested in testing, rather horrifyingly, whether or not strategic bombing could be used in conjunction with chemical weapons. You can see here, this is a picture from the German archives uh, of a chemical test being set up. What the two sides would do is essentially use these cages to simulate buildings. They would lay them out on a street, street-like grid, and then they would fly over with aircraft and spray the field with different chemical agents. The aim, which was quite explicit in uh, discussions of these uh, experiments was to see whether or not a major city could be sprayed with something like mustard gas or phosgene in the next war, wipe out the entire population without damaging a city's industrial capacity, for instance. Now, I'm, I won't go into too much detail about the testing. I'm happy to discuss it more in the Q&A. But interestingly, both sides concluded, based on their work together at Tomka, that the facility, uh, that this new form of warfare was not likely to succeed. Chemical agents dropped from aircraft dispersed too rapidly. I argue in my book, this was one reason that neither side would use chemical warfare in the Second World War. Now I wanna to turn to some of the larger historical takeaways before I move on to contemporary events here. Between 1922 and, and 1933, the Soviet German network that I've described here grew to truly gigantic proportions. Roughly one in four German officers would be involved or study in the Soviet Union during this period, and thousands upon thousands on the Soviet side, including 156 extremely senior officers, including the majority of the country's uh, field marshals, who would study either alongside German counterparts in the Soviet Union or move to Berlin to take courses alongside uh, German army officers. But in January of 1933, Hitler, leading the largest party in the Reichstag, was appointed chancellor by President Hindenburg. Cooperation played a role in that process. The German military had refused to assist Chancellor Schleicher in resisting the Nazis. The key figure in that story was Werner von Blomberg, who would tell a fellow officer at that juncture that, quote, I have seen in Russia what can be gotten out of the masses. My trips to the Soviet Union turned me into a Nazi. And again, I can discuss in the Q&A the role uh, of uh, experience in the Soviet Union played in the radicalization of the German officer corps. But in any instance, the German army did not resist Hitler coming to power in 1933. Now in power, Hitler did not immediately terminate military cooperation. He had known about it since 1928, 
he was generally opposed, but when he came into office, he wasn't entirely uh, certain that he would, would terminate all of these various bases and facilities. Over the course of negotiations in April and May, though, it became apparent the two sides were drifting apart, and Hitler began to relocate all of the training and testing facilities back to Germany, now relatively certain that the, the Allies would not intervene with German rearmament in Germany. Not until 1935 would the last strands of military cooperation be severed. Even then, economic collaboration would continue in a variety of forms all the way through 1941. Now, the role that this cooperation played in the outbreak of the war, I think, is, is very significant, and it's been overlooked in the literature. Because of, of Hitler and his decision to very rapidly begin uh, wide-scale rearmament of Germany's military, uh, Hitler essentially had, had initiated an arms race. And the nature of uh, the German military prior to Hitler coming to power was very much defined by Versailles. It had only a handful of prototypes in aircraft uh, and armored vehicles, again, largely those being tested in the Soviet Union. Now, in, at this juncture, it took between four and six years to develop a tank or an aircraft from scratch. A, a, a military agency would have to decide what the specifications were, send them to corporations for design, prototype development, testing, and then eventually for mass production. It was not a process that could be begun immediately. In essence, Germany began that process between 1933 and 1935, as Hitler poured money into military uh, development and procurement. Because of all of the secret work conducted in the Soviet Union, Germany had prototypes upon which to base its rearmament efforts. And again, keeping in mind that timeline of four to six years, this meant that Germany would possess uh, a military with almost all new equipment between roughly 1937 and 1939. Hitler believed that this was his uh, window of opportunity, a, a technological window, when he would possess a major armaments advantage vis-a-vis -vis Great Britain or France. There was a broad awareness, even panic, in Paris and London over the pace of German rearmament and the fact that Germany was developing a broad array of brand new technologies, while their own arsenals remained, remained largely dependent on obsolete equipment that remained left over from the First World War. When Hitler marched into the previously demilitarized Rhineland in 1936 in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, the chief of the French general staff informed the prime minister that the French military could respond to Hitler and his remilitarization of the Rhineland, but not for at least 12 months. As the chief of staff concluded in his report, the German army, quote, was already the strongest in Europe. Any French efforts to halt Hitler, to try to block his territorial moves, even vis-a-vis -vis the Rhineland, would result in a general war which would evolve into trench warfare and which France very well might lose. The assessment of the British government was very much the same, and part of the reason the British government would pursue appeasement as it accelerated its own rearmament efforts beginning in 1937. In other words, the foundations laid by 11 years of secret rearmament paid almost immediate dividends for Germany, deterring intervention against Hitler as he achieved one foreign policy goal after another between 1935 in 1938. Now, as German rearmament work continued and as relations with the Soviet Union plunged to a nadir thanks to uh, Hitler's vehement rhetoric against the Soviet Union and communism, cooperation would also play a major role in reshaping the Red Army. In industrial terms, the German partnership had already been a huge success by 1933. Hundreds upon hundreds of Soviet engineers had studied alongside their German counterparts. As late as 1923, the Soviets had essentially had no capacity to build armored vehicles or aircraft inside the USSR. But by 1940, the Soviet Union had the world's largest production capacities in both of those areas. By that juncture, half of its tank factories, a majority of its chemical weapons plants, and much of its aviation production depended directly or indirectly upon German assistance. However, that success was in some respects costly for the Soviet Union. On June 2nd, 1937, at a meeting of the Revolutionary Military Council responsible for overseeing all branches of the Soviet military, Stalin made a surprise appearance. He announced shocking news that Deputy Commissar of Defense Mikhail Tukhachevsky, generally assumed to be the brains of the Red Army, 
had been com had committed treason and was being arrested. Stalin claimed that Chukachevsky had passed the Soviet Union's operational plans to the German army. Chukachevsky and nine of his fellow officers were accused of being part of a spy ring working with the Germans that in the event of war would essentially go over to the German side. In the 10 days after Tukhachevsky's arrest, nearly a thousand senior officers in the Red Army would be arrested and many were tortured and shot thereafter. In total, these purges would claim 11% of the Soviet officer corps with disproportionately higher percentages in the senior ranks, over 90% of officers of the divisional commander rank or above. The arrests would decimate Soviet military intelligence, logistics, research, and support services. In total, somewhere between three and four times as many officers would be shot by Stalin in the purges, or general officers, excuse me, as would die in the Second World War. Now, the logic of this process uh, has been hotly debated by historians for some time. But I argue in my book that the German role in educating so many Soviet officers has been neglected among those expl explanations. This is somewhat surprising, as this was the official reason that Tukhachevsky had been arrested and shot. At his show trial, prosecutors claimed that Tukhachevsky had been working alongside the Germans since 1925, which was, of course, true. He had been in close collaboration with his German counterparts at the various secret facilities and even spent extended periods in, Germans, in Germany, disguised uh, as, a, as a Bulgarian officer. Stalin was clearly concerned that the Red Army might not be a reliable instrument in the event of war with Germany. There were too many close ties between the German military and the Red Army. I argue that some of the selection of victims uh, gives a sense of this. In 1937, the list of alumni of collaboration included two of the Soviet Union's five marshals, the commander of the Soviet Air Forces, the commander of Soviet military education, the heads of most of the major military academies, the director of naval construction, as well as most of the country's corps and divisional commanders, almost none of whom survived until 1941. And the selection of victims went even into the lower ranks. People as low as janitors at the various Soviet German bases were arrested and purged as well. Now, the consequences of the purges were one of the reasons that the Second World War would, in fact, uh, begin. The British and French who had been negotiating with Moscow off and on since 1935 recoiled in, in horror. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain wrote that the purges, quote, made Russia an unreliable friend with very little capacity for assistance, but with an enormous irritative effect on others. The French general staff, generally quite enthusiastic about working with the Soviets in this period, concluded that the Soviet Union was now a worthless ally in the event hostilities broke out. The purges had rendered the Red Army essentially incapable of offensive operations. This was one of the reasons for Soviet exclusion from the Munich Conference, as well as for the exclusion of the Soviet Union from the Polish guarantee uh, the following spring. In April of 1939, Hitler, following news of the Polish British guarantee to Poland, guaranteeing the sovereignty of Poland in the event of German aggression, Hitler suddenly decided at that juncture to seek a new partnership with the Soviet Union. That month, Stalin received word from German diplomats of Hitler's desire to, quote, renew the old Rapallo relationship. In other words, the previous decade or so of cooperation in the 1920s and early 1930s. As I said at the beginning of my talk, in, in August 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union had agreed to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact partitioning Eastern Europe between them, with Stalin receiving the lion's share of territory. In exchange, the USSR was expected to supply Germany with critical raw materials, above all, oil and other things necessary for Germany's energy needs. And assistance as well was expected uh, in Germany's war against Great Britain at sea. Military cooperation would indeed soon resume, with the Germans setting up a naval base on Soviet soil. But most importantly, the renewed partnership paved the way for Hitler's invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. Stalin, following the terms of the agreement, invaded from the east some 16 days later. Soviet and German forces would meet in central Poland on September 18th, as the remaining Polish forces fought their way into neutral Romania. This is a photo of a, uh, from a victory parade held jointly by the two sides in Brest-Litovsk after the defeat of Poland in 1939. It's remarkable for a number of reasons. 
But among them is the fact that both of these men uh, were alumni of the previous era of cooperation. Guderian and Krivashane had both studied or attended uh, courses at Kama, the Joint Armored Warfare Facility in the Soviet Union. Now, it's not exactly certain when Krivashane attended the classes. They may or may not have known each other from them. But we do know that they spent uh, some time together conversing in, in French, their mutual language, about uh, past times and about the success of Soviet and German arms in the defeat of Poland on this day in 1939. This was, of course, the, the high point of the Soviet-German relationship. Only 22 months later, the two states would be at war with one another. On June 22nd, 1941, Hitler would launch Operation Barbarossa, the, the largest invasion in world history to that date. Three million German soldiers and hundreds of thousands of their allies would march into the Soviet Union as part of that offensive. More than 30 million people would die on the Eastern Front over the next four years. What is remarkable, and I think often forgotten, is how much in common the two sides had at that particular juncture. Rarely in the annals of history have two opponents spent so much time preparing each other for war. Invading German forces marched on rubber boots made with material that had been imported via the Soviet Union. German rations included Soviet grain. Their ammunition included chrome, nickel, steel, and manganese, all mined in the Soviet Union. German vehicles and aircraft drew heavily from the legacy of engineering work conducted in Russia. And more than a few of them were fueled by Soviet oil that had been pumped in the Caucasus over the preceding year and a half. Many senior German commanders had trained in the USSR. In fact, quite a few even spoke good Russian from their time there. And when German officers issued orders, they drew at least in part on lessons they had learned alongside the Red Army in joint maneuvers and in classrooms together between 1922 and 1933. Now, across the, the lines, the story was somewhat the same. Although far fewer living senior Soviet officers had trained alongside the Germans, most Red Army officers had been trained in facilities organized along German lines, and in some instances staffed by German officers. Among the invading German officers who had served as instructors at major Red Army uh, educational institutions, were Erich von Manstein, Walter Mödel, Friedrich Paulus, who'd be famous for his defeat and capture at Stalingrad, and Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, the uh, future head of the OKW and overall charge of the, the invasion effort. Soviet operations in turn were managed by a Soviet general staff essentially plagiarized from its German counterpart. It reported in 1941 to Semyon Timoshenko, who had studied in, this, in Germany in 1931 as part of educational exchanges. The tanks, aircraft, and artillery the Red Army used to resist the German invasion drew heavily from German designs. In some instances, they were actual copies of German designs produced under license uh, agreements with various German firms. Many of them, in fact, the majority of the medium and heavy Ger Soviet tanks had BMW engines powering them. The vehicles and aircraft themselves had been built in turn in factories constructed with German help, equipped with German machine tools, and in many instances powered by coal that had been mined in the Ruhr and the Tsar. Now, as news of the German attack began to filter in from the West, Stalin reacted with disbelief. Surely, he said, Hitler would not just attack like some brigand. He told his, uh, the Commissar of Foreign Affairs, Molotov, to find the German ambassador, Schulenberg, and, and sort out exactly what was transpiring. As Molotov sat quietly in his office, German ambassador Schulenberg began reading a memorandum accusing the Soviet Union of breaking the German-Soviet pact. Schulenberg concluded his remarks, and a pregnant silence hung in the air of, his, of Molotov's office. Molotov asked, is this supposed to be a declaration of war? Schulenberg could, could essentially merely shrug. He hadn't been given instructions on that note. Molotov replied heatedly that it could be nothing else, as German troops have already crossed the border, and Soviet cities like Odessa, Kiev, and Minsk had been bombed by German aircraft for more than an hour and a half. Schulenberg said nothing. At the end of their interview, all Molotov could stutter was, what have we done to deserve this? Now, before I conclude and we turn to Q&A, I want to talk a little bit about the contemporary significance of this decades-long Soviet-German relationship. There are a lot of different things about this relationship that rhyme with the present moment. 
And again, I'd be happy to discuss them in the Q&A. For instance, uh, the, the continued energy relationship between Russia and Germany, I think is fascinating and uh, in some odd ways parallels uh, the 1920s and 1930s. But today I wanna focus my concluding remarks here on, on how the history itself has been weaponized, uh, particularly in the Russian Federation. Since 1945, the Soviet Union has sought to draw legitimacy from its victory in the Second World War. But the utility of the Second World War as this heroic myth depends on the narrative that the Soviet Union uh, saved the world from Nazism. And inconvenient to that story is the fact that the USSR had spent two decades on and off again as Nazi Germany's partner. Perhaps most embarrassingly, the first third of the Second World War, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were, were partners in a variety of ways. This is one reason, of course, why the Soviet Union did not acknowledge the secret protocol of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact until 1989, and only then with great reluctance that it acknowledged the full scope and scale of, uh, of Soviet-German relations in this period. In fact, Stalin himself uh, likely wrote a, a, a work, we, we are pretty sure of his authorship, essentially denying all of these claims in the late 1940s. This was clearly a, a matter of great importance for the Soviet state. Now, interestingly, Putin, who uh, has a great deal of interest in, in history, largely followed the line of the Russian Federation in the 1990s when he first came to power. He denounced Stalin, he denounced Stalinism. In 20, 2005, for instance, he responded to a, a question about the Soviet-German relationship in, in the 30s and the Molotov-Rimmentrop Pact by describing it as a dangerous act of appeasement and a catastrophic mistake by Stalin. But then interestingly came a change. In February of 2007, in his Munich speech, he unleashed a rhetorical salvo against American unilateralism. And over the next 16 months, the Russian state was involved in a major cyber attack against Estonia, withdrew from the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, and invaded portions of neighboring Georgia, which it occupies to this day. Changes in historical rhetoric essentially accompanied all of these policy changes, which I think is quite significant. In particular, Putin organized a new presidential commission, uh, uh, quite the mouthful, entitled, quote, counter att attempts to falsify the historical record to the detriment of Russian interests. Putin's historical rhetoric became more conciliatory over the, the few years that followed. And the new presidential commission was actually disbanded after having not accomplished much. But then as the Ukraine and Syrian crises began to unfold in 2013, Putin's description of Soviet history began to echo, in some cases, word for word, Joseph Stalin's. He began justifying the Soviet invasion of Poland in 1939, the Baltic states in 1940, and even Stalin's partnership with Hitler from 1939 to 1941. He asked a group of history teachers uh, shortly after the Ukraine crisis began, oh yes, the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression agreement with Germany. They say, oh, how bad? But what is so bad about it? What is so bad, end quote. He argued that Stalin knew a German invasion was inevitable and essentially this partnership bought the Soviet Union vital time. Two months after the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, Putin signed into effect a broad reaching new law against the rehabilitation of Nazism, which created fines and possible prison time for those disparaging the Red Army or Soviet state during the war, a revitalized version of the 2009 bill that he had uh, initially proposed uh, following the invasion of Georgia. This was accompanied by a significant rewriting of Russia's history textbooks. These reversed course on Stalinism, downplayed or justified its horrors by linking them to victory in the Second World War. The changes above all emphasized Russia's right to interfere in its neighbor's affairs based on historical precedents, most notably the salvation the Soviet Union provided from Nazism in Putin's view. The state campaign to change attitudes in Russia seems to have been largely successful. In 2007, 72% of those polled thought that acts of Stalinist repression could not be justified. By 2016, only 45% of people answered the same way. Approval for the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact grew 10% over the same period, while simultaneously almost 10% more Russians believed the pact had not taken place at all 
By 2019, 70% of Russians agreed that, quote, Stalin had played a completely or relatively positive role in the life of our country, end quote. Now, these shifts, I would argue, have been extremely useful from Putin's perspective, which explains why he spent so much time playing historian. He gave a 90-minute lecture on uh, the Soviet-German relationship in the 30s, uh, to a, a group of CIS leaders in December 2019. He then, or at least under his name, an op-ed was uh, published in English in the National Interest a few months later, a very long and very detailed assessment of Soviet diplomacy uh, in the lead up to the Second World War. The shifting attitudes uh, and the success with which the World War II narrative have been used explain his commitment uh, to, to revising history. Navalny, uh, currently in prison and Putin's most uh, significant political opponent, is in fact in prison in part under, uh, under um, the terms of the, uh, the law against the rehabilitation of Nazism, accused of having disparaged a uh, Soviet World War II veteran in a tweet. In addition, when he announced the beginning of a special military operation against Ukraine on, a, on February 23rd of this year, Putin again referenced the Second World War, referenced this history, referenced the relationship to Germany. In this instance, he now compared NATO to Hitler, while combining strategic claims about the buildup of military forces along Russia's border with historical claims about Ukraine's past and about Soviet diplomacy. His comments now fit an arc where Putin has argued with growing vehemence that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a mistake, and increasingly praised historical efforts by Russian and Soviet leaders to violently expand the borders of their state, including increasingly praising cooperation with Nazi Germany. The Russian public seems largely to agree with Putin's historical claims, at least at the present. Putin's approval rating skyrocketed to 83% in the aftermath of the invasion of Ukraine. That the war remains largely popular, or at least uh, the general public is not largely opposed, is at least in part a product of 20 years of rewriting the history of Soviet-German relations, and unfortunately suggests that public support for the war is likely to continue despite battlefield reversals. I'm gonna pause there and, uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, really astonishingly, uh, astonishing view of what happened in the 20s and 30s that has elements that I'm sure many people did not know about. I certainly did not know about. We have gotten a lot of questions. Um, one of the main questions that's been asked repeatedly is, is, is the recording of this going to be made available? And the answer is yes. Will it be made available to anybody who wants to see it? The answer is yes. Uh, will we inform the people who registered for this uh, that there will be a recording? Again, the answer is yes. Um, so let's go through the questions, um, and I'll go them go through them in series. Um, the first one is: Did the extensive knowledge of each other's war fighting capacities give an advantage to one side or the other, as presuming the Soviets and the Germans and the outbreak of their part of World War II? It's a great question. Uh, they spent so much time working in unison; surely that should inform their views of each other. From the German side, it's quite interesting. Um, if we look at uh, military assessments of Soviet capabilities on the eve of Operation Barbarossa, the Germans essentially assumed that the, the Soviet military had not advanced a great deal since 1932 or 33, since their extended stays in the Soviet Union. Heinz Guderian, for instance, told Hitler that he believed the German military based on his, or the Soviet Soviet military, based on his time spent in the Soviet Union, was incapable of effective operations and would likely collapse quite quickly. So there was this dated view in the German mind, based on uh, their work alongside the Soviets, that really did not correspond to the size, scope, or mechanization efforts that had happened after the partnership had begun to unravel. For the Soviets, uh, they had a, a fairly good sense of German technology capabilities. In fact, they received a lot of German technology during the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, including aircraft and tank designs. They had a fairly good sense of what the German military possessed. What surprised them was the success of German military operations against Poland and against France. They hadn't expected Germany to succeed so quickly. In fact, there'd been hopes that uh, Germany and France would bleed each other white, 
and the, that the Red Army would allow, be able to stay neutral and perhaps benefit from the exhaustion of the Western powers in a long war. Had the purges not taken place, that might not have been the case. Tukhachevsky was extremely well informed on German military doctrine. He, he wrote about it extensively in the 1930s. So many of the people who would have been capable of anticipating German moves and uh, the nature of the German attack against the Soviet Union were simply, uh, they, were, they were dead by the time the actual attack came. So by, both sides had incomplete pictures of each other, uh, inspired in part by their, their years of work together. The next question is, did German military intelligence play any role in creating the impression within Stalin's administration during the period of cooperation that Soviet officers were untrustworthy and required for liquidation? The answer is yes. We seem to uh, have some indications that, uh, that German intelligence agencies attempted to pass material through Czechoslovakia implicating Tukhachevsky in uh, essentially a conspiracy to work with them in 1937 and 1938. Now, there's been a lot of debate about to the degree to which Stalin might have believed these sources of intelligence. One thing that's uh, interesting is that it, it appears that a lot of the intelligence was received by Moscow after already Stalin had, had indicated he was going to arrest many of these, these officers. So uh, it, it's a complicated picture and one that uh, likely requires more research. The answer is Stalin probably did not need prodding from Germany to arrest these officers, but the German military was quite happy uh, that the purges decapitated their, uh, their most feared foes, particularly Tukhachevsky, who was regarded with um, great respect in German military circles. Uh, next question is that you said that some compare the ambivalent German-Russian early 20th century military history with the post-perestroika history that led Germany into a huge energy-dependent relationship with Russia. Uh, this, the questioner, that's Mechtel Schmidt, argues that the secrecy of the Weimar Republic's military training might be seen as the opposite of the very open peace through trade approach after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Do you have comments on that? Yes, I, and I think that is that is a really good point. There's, this is a very different relationship. Uh, Germany had to conceal uh, much of its activities in the Soviet Union, of course, in this period. In fact, uh, revelations when they broke in German newspapers in 1926 actually led to the collapse of a German government and a political scandal. Clearly, the relationship is different. I would suggest, though, that there are some elements of the story that rhyme. One thing I found really fascinating is that General Zeich, in all of his writing about Russia, and Zeich spoke Russian. He actually uh, had a hobby of translating Russian poetry into German. This is a guy who um, was very much a Russophile in a number of ways. He wrote in 1922 repeatedly that he believed that one reason this partnership should be pursued is that in the long term, extended economic and military collaboration were likely to moderate the nature of the Soviet government and even make it turn away from the most uh, difficult or problematic parts of, uh, of communist doctrine. So in that way, there's, there is a sort of element that, that seems similar to sort of German geo, uh, geoeconomic strategy in the, in the 90s and 2000s, this idea that economic exchange will moderate uh, and perhaps um, liberalize the states that trade is being conducted with. Zeke had a similar impression, which is odd for someone who was not really a liberal in the 1920s that this might moderate in various ways the Soviet regime. In fact, it, of course, it, it did not. Uh, looking at this picture that you have on the screen here of Guderian and Kurvishan, what strikes me is that this is taking place, this took event, the, uh, the conjunction at brest Litovsk took, took place after the beginning of the Holocaust in Germany. And uh, Kurvishan had Jewish parents. And so it was an interesting um, encounter between somebody representing a government that was determined to exterminate the Jews uh, in an apparent friendly gesture to a Jewish Soviet officer. That's right. I mean, it's one reason this picture is so darkly ironic in many respects yeah. Um, yeah. and tragic. Tragic, very tragic. Well, I think we've run, th aha, we have another question. <laughs> I was going to say, I think we've run through the questions, but we have not. Um, 
this the questioner states that this is a very interesting insightful account connecting technological military histories and also revealing the extended consequences and effects of Apollo. While interesting that so much cooperation took place during Stalin's era, there's a vast difference between 1922 and 1933. I'd love to know more about how raw materials reached German production in the years just before the war and what that reveals about the relationships between Nazi uh, and Nazi German and Soviet economies. Absolutely, yes. So um, the economic relationship in the, in the period of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is, um, it's been very uh, well studied. There's a number of really good books on this. Um, Edward Erickson's uh, book comes to mind, uh, Feeding the German Eagle. But in essence, Germany uh, reached a plateau in military production around 1930, late 1937, 1938, where essentially uh, due to labor uh, bottlenecks and raw material bottlenecks, military production could not be increased. Essentially, Germany tried to turn to the Soviet Union in late 1938 about a possible trade agreement, but it wasn't until after the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that there actually began to be really extensive economic exchange. There, there had been trade that had continued in the 1930s, um, even under Hitler, but it exploded essentially once uh, once the, the pact had been signed. It took about five months and then uh, huge quantities of raw materials began flowing back and forth. So to give some sense, in 1940, uh, the Soviet Union would send Germany uh, the equivalent of about 40% of Germany's oil needs, um, largely by rail, some by ship as well. Uh, they would send a, about a million tons of, of grain westward, uh, more a majority of the uh, tungsten, manganese, and other critical raw materials from munitions production were also coming from the Soviet Union and transported uh, particularly either via the Baltic or via, via rail lines through uh, now partitioned Poland. And in exchange, the Germans were sending what they had traditionally sent uh, eastward, machine tools uh, and finished goods. What is a little bit different is that in this period compared to earlier periods, a very high percentage of those finished goods were weapon systems, huge quantities of uh, of coastal defense guns, artillery, air, entire aircraft designs, tanks, uh, and an, even an entire battle cruiser that was transported uh, to Leningrad where it was finished with, or mostly finished with uh, the assistance of German engineers. So um, the, the, the economic relationship of this period was, was vital because both economies were largely cut off from world trade by the actual outbreak of, of hostilities and became really closely intermeshed uh, between 1939 and 1941. Good. The next question I, doesn't really relate to Germany and the Soviet Union, but to the Soviet Union, it asks, have the German, whoa, it just, it just disappeared from my screen, have the Soviets and the Chinese built up the military capacity in a secret way, in an, in that, I assume in an analogous way to the Germans and the Russians, and the so Germans and the Soviets? Yeah, it's a, that's a very interesting question. It's, it's actually one I, I get a, a uh, quite a bit. Is there? Does this rhyme in some way with the the, the Soviet German or the, the Russian Chinese relationship uh, today? The answer is is yes and no. I mean, clearly Russia and China. Uh, the the reason that they have be, uh, their interests have aligned is a shared hostility to the international order, as it's perceived uh, to to be hostile to their interests in a variety of ways. So clearly, the the reasons they're coming together mirror in some ways, particularly the Rapallo relationship between Germany and the Soviet Union. There are some differences though. Uh, Germany and the Soviet Union were each other's most important trading partner, partners for most of the period from 1900 to 1941 with a few breaks, <laughs> notably wow. the first war. Wow. They were extremely closely tied economically in a variety of ways. Russia and China do not have uh, that, that same relationship, at least not yet. The starting period, um, in the energy front, but, uh, it's, it's really not, uh, not quite the thing. In addition, uh, Russia and China have uh, had their share of, of geopolitical issues between them as well. And um, it's, it's unclear whether their distrust of the international system is uh, great enough to really bring them into the close accord we see uh, between Germany and the Soviet Union in these two periods that I've, I've explored today. Okay. Uh, the next question is, did German leadership have a natural preference for cooperation with the Soviet Union against Poland, or did Polish reluctance to collaborate with the Germans, especially in the 1930s, 
Was that the decisive factor in the decision to destroy the Polish state in cooperation with the USSR? So the answer is that um, the German, the, hit, under Hitler, the German state was very much divided. Ribbentrop, uh, the, the foreign minister, had been uh, pushing Hitler for years to align him, himself with Poland, to bring Poland into partnership against the Soviet Union. In fact, this was the option that was pursued until March of 1939. At that point, when uh, the Pol the Poland had obviously resisted this, had largely refused to pick a side between the Soviet Union and Germany. It signed non-aggression pacts with both states, but essentially otherwise tried to keep its distance in that relationship. Um, when, when Great Britain guaranteed Polish security in March 1939, Hitler concluded that this uh, was a dead end, that Poland was unlikely to agree to any sort of long-term partnership with Nazi Germany. And at that point, uh, Hermann Goering, who had been, largely championed some sort of alignment with the Soviet Union, he became a more prominent voice. Ribbentrop tried to steal his thunder, essentially, in his policy position, and then likewise aligned uh, uh, with Goering on the possibility of pursuing some sort of accord with the Soviet Union. Now, there's a really interesting story here that's been per, uh, really explored by uh, German historians, I think, quite, quite well, um, about the role played by the German foreign ministry. So uh, there were a number of German German diplomats were veterans of the Rapallo era who believed that Germany and the Soviet Union needed to work together. And they really aggressively even falsified information coming out of the Soviet Union to indicate Soviet interest in a partnership. And th these individuals, veterans of this earlier period, played a major role in bringing Hitler and Stalin together in 1939 and trying to keep them together uh, really through 1941. And even uh, possibly trying to get some sort of separate peace between Germany and the Soviet Union during the Second World War itself. So the answer is that there are a lot of divisions within the German state, but uh, we see this this radical shift in the spring of 1939. So I'd like to ask a question of my own. The United States doesn't play any role in the story so far as you've presented it. I'm, there there is a slight tangential indication, perhaps in. Trotsky is living in New York City just before he came to the Soviet Union during before the revolution. But how did the US react or did it not react to anything of the, any of the things that you described? Uh, was there any reaction? Did, was there any knowledge at the time? Uh, the answer is, is yes, there was some knowledge. So there a number of stories have been published in British and American papers about secret collaboration. I think that probably the most interesting uh, American contribution to the story is that as the first Soviet-German par partnership begun to unravel once Hitler came to power, it was largely American firms that stepped into the place the German firms had held in the Soviet economy, providing machine tools, engineers, experts, uh, assistance in building uh, major factories uh, like the Stalingrad Tractor Works and other facilities designed to produce munitions for the Soviet state. Essentially, uh, American firms took over that role after German firms departed the scene and returned to Germany. So th there is that, that kind of interesting American tie-in in the 1930s as a, um, this, these, this main Soviet source of industrial expertise and assistance in industrialization. Okay. You also tend to mention the starvation among the civilian population around these areas. Um, how did the Germans react to starving people outside of their facilities? Yes, I so I, I had one source that was very interesting. I had um, a number of Soviet secret police records. They monitored essentially all of the German officers and men who came into the Soviet Union. And they record sort of disparate reactions to scenes of uh, some of the worst horrors of Stalinism playing, playing out right outside of these facilities. So on one hand, um, some of the German officers clearly became radicalized against communism. The Soviet intelligence sources indicate that more and more uh, were identified with the far right of the German political scene the longer they spent time in the Soviet Union. This is something I talk a little bit about in the book. So there's clearly this element where a number of German officers are, are really becoming horrified uh, with this experience in the Soviet Union. Um, on the other hand, there are a number of senior officers who are not only not bothered by the experience uh, of, of seeing people starve to death. They're impressed by the ability of the Soviet state to marshal resources and to industrialize and to concentrate its efforts on rearmament, something they, they really think Germany should be doing too. So a number of senior officers like, uh, like Manstein, 
uh, and, and others, uh, th their experience doesn't seem necessarily to, uh, or, or sorry, Blomberg, uh, that their experience is actually one that suggests, well, this isn't so horrible. They're a little concerned about the fate of Volga Germans. They don't really care about Soviet civilians, but they are impressed by the ability of the Soviet state to get things done. And that they bring home and, and bring with them into the German army. So lastly, what question would you like to have asked, been asked that has not been asked? <laughs> Is there a question that you want, want people to ask that, that they have not? <laughs> Oof. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So many great questions to consider here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, well, maybe a, a slightly self-promotionally, I, uh, I can ask myself about my next project. There you go. Good. Be of interest. Um, so I, um, as, as some of you might have gathered, uh, this, this project um, has discouraged me from returning to the Russian archives for some time. And, and the war in Ukraine has made that uh, an even more difficult prospect. So I'm actually currently working on a history of the origins of NATO, looking at essentially attempts to preserve the Grand Alliance of the Second World War through the United Nations. And when that failed, how that led to the establishment uh, and organization of NATO. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you for all for the wonderful talk. Uh, thanks to Mechtilt for assisting me and reminding that we had to record it <laughs> or else we'd be in trouble. Uh, thanks to all our sponsors who helped uh, get the audience together and uh, make this possible. And thank you, Ian, for, for a great and wonderful talk. Uh, we'll have to catch you again when you finish your book on NATO. Uh, great. Something like that. So let me give start a round of applause and thank you so much. Okay, all right, and uh, we'll we'll send the recording to everybody who registered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye bye.